Welcome back to the series on the authorship and dating of the Gospels. Let's get right to it with the Gospel according to Luke. If you'll remember from the introduction, we started off by talking a lot about what Martin Hingle has to say. It must be asserted that in the present state of our knowledge, the titles of the Gospels are by no means late products from the second century, but must be very old. With a considerable degree of probability, they can be traced back to the time of the origin of the four Gospels between 69 and 100, and are connected with their circulation in the communities. Now, Martin Debellius agrees with this and turns our attention specifically to Luke and Acts. Both writings, Gospel and Acts, were offered to the literary reading public from the very beginning under the name of Luke as author. He also explains that since Luke's Gospel, as well as Acts, both have the name of the addressee in their introduction, that the name of the author would have been known as well, and it would have been indicated on a tag attached to the scroll. Carson and Mu echo numerous other scholars when they say, It is hard to understand why Luke's name would have been attached to the gospel if it had not been there from the beginning. The manifest tendency in the early church was to associate apostles with the books of the New Testament. The universal identification of a non-apostle as the author of almost one quarter of the New Testament speaks strongly for the authenticity of the tradition. And once again, the testimony of church history is unanimous. Marshall notes, There is never any suggestion of a rival candidate for the honor of writing the gospel. Leon Morris notes, Tradition unanimously affirms this author to be Luke. This is attested by the early heretic Marcion, the Muratorian fragment, the anti-Marcionite prologue to Luke, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, and others. And from Tertullian, the same authority of the apostolic churches will afford evidence to the other Gospels also, which we possess equally through their means and according to their usage. I mean the Gospels of John and Matthew, whilst that which Mark published may be affirmed to be Peter's, whose interpreter Mark was. For even Luke's form of the Gospel men usually ascribe to Paul. From Irenaeus, Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book, the gospel preached by him. Clement of Alexandria also refers to the gospel written by Luke. For external evidence, we can look at P75, which is dated between 175 and 225 and ascribes the book to Luke. By now, you should be getting used to the fact that history affirms the unanimous tradition of the authorship of the gospels. Internal and external evidence combine to point strongly to Luke, the doctor, Paul's dear friend as the author. Now let's look at some internal evidence in the gospel to figure out some characteristics that the writer of the gospel may have had. Plausibly a Gentile, he was obviously educated, proficient in Greek, and a versatile and competent writer. But we can't go too much further in looking at the internal evidence without considering the connection between Luke and and Acts. Ever since Henry Cadbury's work back in the 1920s, scholars have been much more aware of the implications of this connection. Both books written by the same author and probably separated due to logistical issues. The books are much larger back then, and so it makes sense to separate them out for convenience. Leon Morris gives us a helpful analysis. In Acts, there are four passages in which the writer uses the pronoun we, and then he lists them. These appear to have been taken from the diary of one of Paul's companions. One of the we sections yields the information that the writer stayed for some time in Caesarea with Philip, the evangelist, and his four daughters. It was not until more than two years later that he and Paul sailed for Rome. This period spent with such companions must have given opportunity for discovering much about Jesus and the early church. Now he continues in talking about this connection between Paul and Luke. Paul speaks of Luke as the beloved physician, referring to Colossians 4.14. Now, with respect to Luke being a physician, there is a rather humorous bit of data that Leon Morris brings to our attention. It is a very human touch that he omits the statement that the woman with the hemorrhage had spent all her money 
on doctors. Now, Luke, as a physician, may have been somewhat offended by that statement. We also find mention of Luke in Philemon as well. He's referred to as one of Paul's fellow workers. Now, Leon Morris once again gives us a helpful summary. Acts ends with Paul in Rome, and the author is perhaps to be looked for among those named in the captivity epistles, or 2 Timothy, as being with him but not mentioned in Luke-Acts. This leaves us with a small group. There seems to be no reason for thinking of any of these apart from Luke as being our author. Now, before we talk about the dating of Luke's gospel, let's talk briefly about the role of eyewitnesses in it. Richard Balkum is talking about his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, when he says, I argue in the book that in the early church there was a principle of eyewitness testimony from the beginning, stated in Luke, Acts, and John, that the most important testimony was that of disciples who had been with Jesus from the earliest days of his ministry and could testify to the whole course of events up to and including the resurrection appearances. Now, if you'll remember from the video on the Gospel of Mark, he uses Peter kind of like an inclusio, like bookends. Peter is the first disciple that Mark mentions, and he's also the last. So keep that in mind as we hear from Balkum again. My identification of the inclusio of eyewitness testimony as a recognizable device in Mark is confirmed by the fact that Luke takes the trouble to produce an equivalent of it acknowledging his debt to Peter's testimony, as he had it in Mark's Gospel. The key point here is that the references to Peter as the first disciple to be named in Luke and the last to be named are not the same as Mark's. And so it is not as though the pattern in Mark has reappeared in Luke simply because of Luke's incorporation of Mark's material. And one more from Bauckham. Luke is the only synoptic evangelist who actually writes about his sources in the preface to his gospel. There he claims that his traditions come from those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. If a reader were then to read the gospel, keeping an eye out for who these eyewitnesses might be, the first point at which he or she would find a character who continues to appear through the narrative would be Luke's first reference to Peter. The eyewitnesses of Luke's preface must include Peter as at least prominent among them. Now, this Luke-Acts connection also becomes important when we look at dating the Gospel of Luke. There are two serious possibilities, a date in the early 60s or a date in the later decades of the first century. The latter is the view most commonly held, with 8080 being suggested as a round figure. On the other hand, the complete lack of interest in the fall of Jerusalem in Acts and the way in which the book ends its story before the death of Paul are strong indications of a date before AD 70. On the whole, a date not far off, AD 70, appears to satisfy all requirements. Now, Leon Morris gives us some data to consider for both the late and the early dates in his commentary. With respect to the late date, some sayings of Jesus seem to show that Luke was writing after the fall of Jerusalem. Luke used Mark and therefore must be later than AD 68. Now, of course, this assumes Mark in priority as well as dates for Mark somewhere in uh, probably about the mid-60s. So those are two assumptions. There is no good reason for dating Luke far from Matthew, and Luke tells us that many had written before him in his introduction. Leon Morris also lists some data that points to an early date. Acts ends with Paul in prison. The pastoral letters seem to show that Paul visited Ephesus again. Luke notes the fulfillment of the prophecy of Agabus. Acts shows no knowledge of the Pauline epistles, and so must be early. And finally, no event after AD 62 is mentioned. So let's wrap up with some conclusions, both from the material relevant to Luke in the introduction to this series, as well as what we've covered in this video. It is improbable that the gospel could have been renamed from another author and distributed so quickly. The book is universally ascribed to Luke in ancient tradition. We have no indication that the gospel ever circulated without an appropriate title. It is implausible to assign authorship illegitimately to a non-apostle. Internal evidence coheres with Lucan authorship. Luke and Acts share the same author. There are numerous connections between Luke and Paul, attested to both in the New Testament and extra-biblical sources. And Luke was plausibly written in the early 60s. We will wrap this series up when we talk about the authorship and dating of the Gospel of John in the next video. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.